Welcome to Westbury United Methodist Church. As always, I'm grateful that you are able to join together in worship. Uh, if you're watching this early enough on Sunday morning, March 7th, you are invited to come to our front brickyard at the church for drop-in communion between the hours of 9 and 10.30 a.m. Uh, as people arrive in small groups, we'll gather, celebrate the great Thanksgiving, observe this blessed sacrament, um, and that's a way for us to be together in smaller groups. If you can't make it, you are welcome to join us for online communion via Zoom at 11 a.m. We will continue this practice until, um, until public health officials say we can gather together. Uh, so go to our church website backslash communion and you will find uh, information and the liturgy for us to follow through that Zoom call. Also on Sunday at noon, there is our Lunch and Learn, and this week it is Pastor Hannah who will be sharing what Fan Houston has been doing through this uh, uh, unprecedented year. Um, and then there are opportunities to sing for the upcoming High Holy Days of Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. Uh, for our children, there's a Palm Sunday choir that meets Sunday afternoon, and for our adults, our Easter adult choir meets on Tuesdays and Thursdays. For information about that, send Pastor Bodie an email, tell him you want to join in our choir. And you can find um, a few more ways to connect with the church family at our website backslash updates. Uh, that is updated about once a week with different events and ways to connect and to be together through these unusual times. Um, and I thank you for the ways you have stayed connected as a church family um, through different events we have, through Zoom calls, um, through praying for each other. Uh, through your gifts and through registering your attendance and, and letting the world and letting God and letting everyone you can know um, that you will continue to worship our God through this time. Uh, and it is through your connection and through your participation that uh, this church is so special and that Westbury can stake its claim that we are a church for all people with more than enough love to go around. Come, join with me in worship. Please join me in our call to worship. Called by Christ, we gather as one. Blessed by God's wisdom, we gather to learn. Amazed by God's love, we gather to worship.
Join us in affirming our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day He rose again. He ascended, ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Friends, this is the moment in our worship service that we invite you to pass the peace of Christ with each other. In this season of worshiping virtually, it's really, really, really important that we remind each other that we belong to one another, that even though we worship virtually, we are connected through the power of the Holy Spirit and the love of Jesus. So go ahead and pause this video, pull out your phone or use your phone you're watching this video on and send a text, make a call. Make even a video call. Let somebody know that you love them and you share Christ's peace together. Friends, peace be with you.
everyone, I'm Katie. And I'm Owen. And today we're going to talk about the children's sermon. So in the children's sermon today, we're talking about a time when this was after the really big party that Jesus had. And he went to a garden to pray. And he prayed by himself. And one of the things that he prayed about God to God for is that he was really thankful that even though he was going to leave and he wasn't going to be with us, we were still going to have this example of God and what God thinks and what God wants us to do. So there's a lot of times where we're not sure about something. We're not sure what God wants because have we ever seen God here in front of us? Mm -hmm. No, we really haven't. We but, did see God on the paint wall. <laughs> but have we seen Jesus and the things that Jesus does? Yeah. So when we can see the stories of the things that Jesus does, it helps us to know more about God. Can you think of anything else that maybe is kind of like that? Like we can't- Hurricane. A hurricane? You can't see a hurricane. You can see it affects flash floods. And it may have a tornado. And it may have a tornado. And it has so much wind, trees fall down. There's a lot of things that can happen when a hurricane comes, right? We're, we're seeing the effects of what happened when the hurricane was here, but we don't necessarily see like one big hurricane, right? And that's kind of like with God and Jesus. We don't see God here, but we can see a lot of the things that God does. And through Jesus and the stories that we know about Jesus, we can know about how God wants us to be. We can know more about who God is and what God thinks about things. So like if we want to know how to treat somebody, like let's say um, I have a friend and how should I treat my friend? We can think about like how you want to be treated. How you want to be treated, right? That's one of the things that Jesus taught us. And we know that Jesus wants us to, to love others and to be nice to others. But right? if you want to be treated badly, do not treat the other person nicely. I mean, treat them nicely, but if you want to be treated badly, I'm sorry, that's not going to happen. <laughs> okay. Are you ready to pray? Yes, I am. All right. Dear God. Thank you, thank you so much for sending your son Jesus so that we can learn more about you and more about how to treat others. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of John 17, 13 through 26. But now I am coming to you and I speak these things in the world so that they may, be, they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has, has hated them, because they do not belong to the, to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world sanctify them in the truth your word is truth as you have sent me into the world so i have sent them into the world and for their sakes i sanctify myself so that they also may be sanctified in truth i ask not only on behalf of these but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire those also whom have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Please join me in prayer. May the words of my mouth 
And the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Pray for me. I hope you get to ask that of someone if you have not already. It is a request that is rooted in relationship an ask that happens when you know there is love. Every person in our church should know someone, should be part of a group where they can show up and just say, pray for me. But what actually happens when we pray? Does it make a difference? To no surprise, science has tried to tackle this question. And the way they set up their experiment is to see if praying for people actually produces positive medical outcomes. And the raw numbers say, no, it doesn't make a difference. And that partially makes sense to me. Because what if there was a statistically significant difference between those who received prayer and those who didn't? Well, I guarantee that our faith would be packaged, commoditized, and sold. There would be prayer warrior rankings, statistics on whose prayers, person's prayers were the most effective. And we really wouldn't be surprised if somehow that talent got monetized. How much prayer and whose prayer can you afford? Really though, the question that lies beneath does prayer make a difference is why pray? Does prayer make a difference is looking for a transaction, a cause and effect relationship. I pray and then this happens, but what we really want to know is why should we pray? Well, one very direct answer to that question, why pray, is simply because Jesus prays. When we pray for someone, we make a connection. We believe by faith that something does happen that there is some healing, something that might not be measurable, but, but prayer reshapes things. And consider what happens when we know people are praying for us. I think about when our older daughter was just learning to pray, and she would pray for everything. You sneezed, she'd pray for you. Her toy fell over, and she'd pray for the toy. Or you would accidentally ram your foot into the table leg, crumple down in pain, and she'd say, Dear God, please help Papa with his toe. Amen. Unfortunately, she's lost that pray without ceasing zeal. But, you know, the seed is planted and it's in there somewhere. But again, think of what happens when you know you are being prayed for. And then recognize this fact from our passage today. Jesus prays for us. Jesus prays for you and for me. It's right there in verse 20. I ask not only on behalf of these, he's talking about his disciples, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word. That's us. We are the ones who will believe in Jesus because of the disciples' word. It's the only passage I can think of where Jesus speaks specifically about the generations of believers to come, including us. Now, this passage comes at the end of both the farewell discourse and the high priestly prayer, which is what all of chapter 17 is called. These are all those red letter words that only John records. And these are the words that prepared this, the disciples for Jesus' departure. And this is the prayer that prepares us for what is to come. Things are going to change soon, and they're going to change quickly. How then should Jesus pray for us? When we look at what the church often reaches for, what the church aspires for, we might think that Jesus asks God to give us power. That Jesus wants the church to occupy positions of influence, 
whether through wealth or politics or media. Maybe the means to achieve this power is through miracles. So Jesus should pray that we can continue to uh, practice the wonders that Jesus did. At least when we look at how the church often behaves, we would be mistaken to think that's what Jesus prayed for. What does Jesus pray for? Unity. The second half of that prayer for us, Jesus' prayer for you and me, he says, I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. That's a prayer, a request that should make us pause and acknowledge the timelessness of Jesus' prayer because division is so easy to find. Y'all, I learned this week that Dr. Seuss got canceled. And he got canceled for the wrong book. You want to talk about books that hurt people? This is the book that should have been canceled. Hop on pop. And I know, I know, at the very end it says, stop, you must not hop on pop. But try and convince two kids after they see this image of jumping on pop and try to convince them they should not hop on pop. It doesn't work. And y'all, I have the stomach bruises to prove that telling kids to not hop on pop doesn't work. But seriously, Dr. Seuss didn't really get canceled. Uh, in fact, Dr. Seuss book sales shot up this week. So nice work, Dr. Seuss Foundation. Um, what happened was his family foundation decided to stop publishing six specific books. And trust me, Dr. Seuss has a lot more than six books. And if you read more about Dr. Seuss, it is a complicated legacy. Uh, he has drawn unmistakably and inarguably racist caricatures, uh, some for which he himself during his life apologized for. And I say it's complicated because through this learning, some believe that's what made Dr. Seuss write Horton Hears a Who. When he heard about the damage he caused from drawing Japanese and Japanese Americas in a certain way. And Dr. Seuss in his editorial cartoons was one of the only people, aside from the black press, to argue against anti-Jim Crow laws. And even to point out the anti-Semitism of Charles Lindbergh. And so he is a complicated person with a, um, a story that demands more than a headline. But the announcement that six books would be canceled, what well, felt like it just brought more division to our nation. Or, closer to home, consider our denomination, the United Methodist Church. We remain on the precipice of a split, postponed by a global pandemic. And yet, the group that wants to splinter off and create a new denomination and while they will list a number of different reasons they want to do this, the catalyst, so I'm not gonna say this is the only reason they're doing or the primary reason, but the catalyst for them creating a new domination is to make sure that LGBTQ people cannot get married or be ordained. And this group decided that now is the time to release the new denomination's name and logo the Global Methodist Church. And yet when we peer deeper into these divisions, we find that division actually creates greater unity within your group. It's why CPAC, the Conservative Political Action Conference, rallied around the theme, America Uncancelled. It's why the Global Methodist Church chose this week to announce themselves, because we also learned this week that General Conference would be delayed yet another year. So division, ironically, creates the opportunity for greater unity within your tribe. And the unity Jesus prays for? Well, in many ways, it is no different. Because Jesus knows it is unity that cannot encompass every person in the world. 
Because within this prayer, Jesus recognizes a divide between the world and those who believe in him. There is a divide when we pledge our allegiance to Jesus. There's a divide when we name love as our first priority. There's a divide when we stake our salvation on a first century brown-skinned Palestinian Jew. That is a divide that the world often cannot understand and may even be hostile toward. And yet, this is not a divide that Jesus sees as impassable. This divide can somehow be crossed. There is a bridge that can cover this divide. Because if we, the ones who believe in Jesus, can be one, well then the world may believe that Jesus indeed is heaven sent. The world may understand the glory that God has given to Jesus. The world may see hope and healing in the crucified and risen Savior. The world just might begin to believe. And it starts with unity. So what kind of unity will it be? Unity that builds from the inerrant and inspired scriptures. Unity from certain intellectual ideas, propositions, or laws we say we believe. Unity around a social justice, a liberating agenda for all people. Well, maybe those things will happen as a result of our unity. But it is not what our unity is built upon. The unity, the oneness that Jesus desires and prays for, it's the conclusion of all the themes in the farewell discourse of this long speech that is preparing his disciples and us for the days ahead. It's a unity that begins with the willingness to wash each other's feet, even the one who would betray you. It's a unity that finds life in Jesus, our true vine. Unity from abiding and remaining in Jesus. It's a unity that knows our highest calling is to love one another. And as we heard in Jesus' prayer, it's a unity that mirrors the relationship between God and Jesus. Jesus prays, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us. And that gives me a profound sense of comfort in these COVID times when we just can't gather together. Because during his time on earth, Jesus felt this physical distance from God. And yet, unity and oneness is possible even when we can't touch. And my hope is that you have experienced this promise of oneness in some way this past year. Maybe it's through seeing the multiple windows of a Zoom call, or through text messages, or through drive-by parades, or care packages, or gift bags, through praying for each other. I'll share that on the first Wednesday of each month. Uh, our Living Waters Caring Ministry meets together via Zoom. And it heals my soul to be invited into that circle of love and unity. These are people that love, that pray, and that seek the unity that Jesus wants us all to exhibit. And I shared with them that it is one of the highlights of my month to be with them. And this week when I was leaving and, and had this passage on my mind, you know what I feel when I get to be with that special crew? Joy. And I think Jesus knows that when our minds, when our lives are driven more by seeking the unity that loves than defining ourselves through the vision, we'll find that joy is preferable to outrage. We'll find that joy becomes complete 
rather than elusive. We'll find joy in the spring that bubbles up to eternal life. And my hunch is that it is this joy that Jesus promises, joy that is birthed from unity and oneness, it is that joy that just might convince the world that Jesus is Lord. This unity, this intimacy of being for and being with one another, this is what Jesus prays for. This is what Jesus prayed for when he walked upon the earth. And I am certain that this is what Jesus continues to pray for us today. Jesus is praying now for us that we may be one. May it be so. Amen. Please join us in prayer. O oh God, we are one with you. You have made us one with you. You have taught us that if we are open to one another, you dwell in us. Help us to preserve this openness and to fight for it with all our hearts. Help us to realize that there can be no understanding when there is mutual rejection. Oh God, in accepting one another wholeheartedly, fully, completely, we accept you and we thank you and we adore you and we love you with our whole being because our being is in your being and our spirit is rooted in your spirit. Fill us then with love and let us be bound together with love as we go our diverse ways, united in this one spirit which makes you present in the world and makes you witness to the ultimate reality that is love. Love has overcome. Love is victorious. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who prays for us and teaches us to pray our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, receive these words as our sending forth. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up her countenance upon you and may they give you peace. Go with that peace to love and serve the Lord and the world. Amen. Thank you.